I have just a couple of quick announcements. Mainly, I just want to call your attention to the presentation that we'll be having next week after church. Lunch will be provided, and our speaker will be Kat Kusiemba, who is a Ukrainian-American, who will be speaking about the situation in, in Ukraine. But to, what I'd really love to do now is introduce our guest preacher, Michael Chen, who is here with his family, his wife Rachel, their sons, and their newborn baby girl. Michael has working on his PhD in marriage and family therapy, and I know he has a lot to say to help all of us who really probably need it right now. Mike? Well, good morning. Good morning. It's very good to be with you. As the people of God, it's always good to gather. Uh, our scripture from First Peter. And I apologize, I, I might be reading a different translation here. But. Having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love, love one another earnestly from a pure heart since you have been born again, not of perishable seed but of imperishable, through the living and abiding word of God, for all flesh is like grass, and all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers and the flower falls, but the word of the Lord remains forever. And this word is the good news that was preached to you. So put away malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander. Like newborn infants, long for the pure spiritual milk, that by it you may grow up into salvation, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. This is the word of the Lord. So this morning, uh, I want to thank, um, obviously, Matt, Pastor Matt and Rebecca, um, who were cl college classmates uh, of mine, uh, just to say that uh, thank you for inviting me here. It is an honor to be with you this morning, and really beyond my own limited imagination, uh, to think uh, that over 20-some years later, um, that we would, in a sense, be partnering together in the gospel, um, even here in Wayne, Pennsylvania. <laughs> a beautiful, beautiful thing. It's also by providence, I, I think, that um, I'm here to speak to you and address uh, the passage in First Peter that presents to us a juxtaposition, a juxtaposition of two very, two very powerful images, one of birth on one hand and having been born again and being called and compared to being newborn infants and that of death, that is things passing away withering, falling. So let me back up a moment. I know you as a church have been looking at First Peter, examining themes of exile, what it means to suffer, to suffer well, and have been through many significant transitions, losses, and some gains. This is still a new chapter for you as a church, isn't it? So as a doctoral student and having now spent 20 years in campus ministry, I've been planted in many different communities, various sizes, shapes, uh, having been currently studying intensely for the past year or so the nature of trauma and collective trauma in, in particular, healing from trauma. So it might be said that the word trauma is vastly overused, it might be true. Uh, my 11 and 12 year old boys have certainly heard the language of trauma of being triggered, uh, have tried it out in our conversations sometimes successfully, sometimes uh, not so successfully. Nevertheless, we, we, bless these, we invite these conversations, we bless them and, and we treasure them. But as I read First Peter, through the landscape of what we know to be true about the nature of trauma, what brings trauma, the impact of trauma, I think there are some key insights to glean here. So perhaps we can just imagine together just the condition of the early church, the earliest followers of Jesus, and what First Peter describes as the exilic nature of being in the wilderness, right, of not belonging. And while we don't know definitively the precise social location of the early Christian community, we know that they're mostly Gentile, like that is non-Jews, Right. A group of minorities, marginalized, not at the center, 
living without power and privilege. So it's not difficult to imagine some level of food scarcity, fragmentation in terms of community, life with anxiety, under the threat of persecution, under the, 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 the threat of loss of home, the loss of family members, the loss of regular rhythms, rituals, comforts, the threat of being thrust into chaos, confusion, uncertainty. There's a real threat of loss, of the community dissolving, of being absorbed into the machinery of the Roman Empire. So the term migration trauma, or even collective trauma, I think very aptly describes the situation here. So it's fascinating that in the midst of this, Peter employs a really robust theological imagination as a form of resistance, as an act of defiance in calling upon an older story from the prophet Isaiah. All flesh is like grass, and all its glory, the flower of grass, the grass withers, the flower falls, but the word of the Lord remains forever. So what we know to be true about trauma, one of the central features of PTSD and the, and the neurobiology of trauma is that parts of the brain responsible for language actually go offline. There's a, there's a sense of wordlessness for those with unaddressed trauma. And in that wordlessness and inability to form coherent narratives, one with beginning, middle, and end. So in this persecution, in the heightened levels of, of cortisol from stress, hypervigilance, Peter draws upon a much older story to help locate, ground, comfort the church. In this case, it's the story of Israel, living in exile in Babylon. To draw upon that story is an act of resistance to the community being overwhelmed, swallowed up by the corruption and violence of the Roman Empire. So in this context, for someone to say, all flesh is like grass, is actually to bring language and order to the chaos and confusion, to place oneself in a very particular narrative. All flesh is like grass. Also implies a dismantling of all the powers all the principalities, all the people, all the systems that stand against the kingdom of God and its goodness, kindness, peace, and justice. So if we're attuned at all, in a very basic sense, to the news, we feel that this time in history is being dismantled. There's a dismantling happening. Even in the church as we know it, exposure of leaders, the collision of politics, the polarization of the church, and Christian nationalism. These past several years have felt apocalyptic, haven't they? So this process of dismantling has been so unsettling. But the good news comes to us. The word of the Lord abides forever. So while I love the Bible, I don't think Isaiah, I don't think Peter have in mind the Bible as we know it. I, I don't think Peter has in mind just going to Starbucks, sitting down for a morning devotional time, though I do love that. The word of the Lord always came through people, always came through prophets, always came through messengers who in word and deed embodied the very life, the presence of God. I want to come back to this. All flesh is like grass. Speaks to this dismantling. So I, I don't know what particular losses you have suffered. I don't know where you are in your journey of exile. But any kind of passing away of old things invites us into a process of transformation. Invites us into a process of grief. All flesh is like grass, and all its glory, like the flower of grass, is withering and falling away, speaks to the disruption, to the way things are, to the way in which things have always been. This disruption, 
might be quite exciting for some at the outset, but no matter who you are, no matter who you are, no matter what situation you are in, there's a kind of death in that. And where there is death, there must be room for grief. All flesh is like grass. Does not mean that the body is bad, that we are just waiting here, gutting it out, to get to heaven, to live as disembodied souls. So much of reading this without the historical context, I think, can lead us to conclusions that the body is bad. As the Neoplatonist said, that there isn't value, right? There isn't goodness, there isn't divinity in the embodied and incarnational reality of, of God coming to us. But again, all flesh is like grass, invites us to begin to enter into a story of transformation. In the disruption of old things passing away, it is an invitation to join our lives to Israel's story as God's people. A story that culminated in the person of Jesus as the Logos, as the living word, the one who holds all things together, the light, darkness, heaven and earth, humanity, divinity, even death and resurrection. All flesh is like grass. This invites us to ponder, what have we lost? What is being disrupted in and around us? Have you allowed yourself to grieve? Who has held you in your grief? In this unsettling disruption of, of things fading, I want to say something perhaps even more disturbing. That you yourselves are the word of God to one another. Right? The word of God is more than just the ink and the pages of the Bible as we know it, but something more living and dynamic. And as the story of Israel has unfolded and culminated in the person of Jesus, has he not sent you his spirit? Has he not lavished the gifts of the spirit onto you? The presence and power of Jesus in and through you is remarkable. And you, just being you in Christ, joined together with him in union, bear something of his image, of his presence in a world that is in chaos, that is being dismantled every day, not just in the church. Seemingly every sector of life we hear about scandal, we hear about corruption, we hear of war, we hear of abuse of power. But the word of the Lord breaks into that space and most prominently the presence of God in and through messengers who bear the message of the kingdom of God, marked by justice, mercy, kindness. These things are being communicated and embodied here at Liberty Church in unique and remarkable ways. Your presence is what we need. Programs are great, but it is your presence that will give the world an experience of the word of God. It's not easy, but it's good news. There is in this dismantling a kind of death, a, a dying, but right there with it is also a birth. So I want to speak to newborns as you hear the cries of our baby, seven week old baby. While you may have blocked out the memory of newborn days if you were a parent, I'm here to remind you, newborns are a mess. So I wish I could say it has been just an easy, glorious time that every time I've been spit up on, I've just erupted into singing, holy, holy, holy. No, absolutely not. The process of becoming human, becoming a people, together is a mess. 
with newborns and particularly the, 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 the process of labor and delivery, there's crying, there's screaming, there's urine, there's blood, there's fecal matter, there's loss of control, there's helplessness, there's sleep deprivation, there's the feeling of unraveling, there's pain, there's unknown. And yet Peter wants to remind you of your newborn status. Does it sound like a good time? My guess is that the apostles were not intimately acquainted with some aspects of childbirth and the care of newborns and infants. Like, did they even consult Hebrew midwives before choosing the metaphor of birth? Probably not. Being born again, being born of God, I dare say, is just as messy and disruptive as our biological birth. But we also have to say that it is, as messy as it is, it is inherently a good process because it is a relational process. With all the spoken, unspoken cues, the struggle to communicate, learning to trust, to attach, perhaps in ways that feel unfamiliar, is hard, but it's good. All these processes are pointing, to, pointing us to a sense of new family, a new reality, new systems, a new kingdom. So as our baby Evelyn grows from newborn to a young girl to a woman, our desire is that she would know Jesus, that she would come to know and experience honor, delight, kindness, truth, the very opposite of what is mentioned here in this passage describing evil and processes, right, inherent to systems of oppression, malice, envy, hypocrisy, slander. So may it be true of you as well, as you grow with one another in the mess of new birth, to, the, to know the depths of his kindness, his delight, his speaking truth in your life. May there be honor. All flesh is like grass. This certainly speaks to the Babylon that we find ourselves in, the upheaval in the systems of injustice and oppression that have shaped us, shaped our imaginations, the very ones that have benefited us on one hand, created opportunities for us, yet on the other hand have also brought us spiritual moral poverty in so many ways. All flesh is like grass. I think it also speaks to the interior exile, the ways in which we're so disconnected from ourselves. Things holding us captive, enslaving, ensnaring, the ways in which we do not feel comfortable in our own skin. The inner tensions and anxieties we feel, inadequacy, the shame that has been there as long as we can remember. All flesh is like grass is a pronouncement, a precursor, alerting us that we must journey through exile in Babylon to see, to feel, to witness to the tragedy of it if we are to experience the goodness and the blessing of the presence of the word of God. So as I close, may the former things pass. May there be newness for you, and may the kindness of God lead you there. Let's pray. Thank you, God, that you have called us from death into life. You have called us to be newborns through the arduous journey and the process of labor and delivery to gain a place in your kingdom, in your family. So with gratitude, with humility, we come to you this morning, offering up our lives unto you to say that we want to know Jesus more and more. 
the author and perfecter of our faith. Kindness, the mercy, the gentleness, the faithfulness that will lead us through exile and through every season. Thank you for the power of your spirit to transform that as old things pass away, we hold steadfastly to you and to your love. We bless you. We thank you in this morning for our family, for this church. We pray for its peace. We pray for its maturity. We pray all this confidently in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.